This is a picture test in practical anatomy of the upper limb. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, you may pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then you can replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Now I will deal with the anatomy of the arm and forearm. Identify the bony part A, which bones articulate with it, and identify the bony part B, which tendon is attached to it. This is the head of the radius, A. Its proximal end is cup-shaped and articulates with the capitulum of the humerus as part of the elbow joint. The circumference of the head is related to the annular ligament which binds the head to the radial notch of the ulna, where the head of the ra radius articulates with the radial notch of the ulna at the proximal or superior radio-ulnar joint. B is the radial tuberosity and it provides attachment for the tendon of biceps brachii muscle. Thus, biceps can act on the radius and rotate it in supination. Identify the bony process A, which muscle of the arm is attached to it, and identify the fossa B, which muscle is attached to it. The process A is located at the proximal end of the ulna. It is the coronoid process. Note the rough area on the coronoid process. This is the tuberosity of the ulna, and it is produced by the attachment of brachialis muscle. Brachialis arises in the arm from the front of the distal part of the humerus, passes in the front of the elbow joint, and is attached to the tuberosity of the ulna. Thus, the muscle is a powerful flexor of the elbow joint. B is the supinator fossa. It is for the attachment of the ulnar head of supinator muscle, the deep head of supinator. The supinator arises by two heads, humeral and ulnar head. The humeral head is superficial and arises from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, while the ulnar head arises from the supinator fossa and the crest, supinator crest of the ulna behind it. The muscle supinator wraps around the back of the radius to be inserted into the proximal third of the shaft of the radius and thus the muscle can rotate the radius in supination. Identify the muscle A, what is its nerve supply, which bones provide the distal attachment of the muscle. This is a dissection of the flexor compartment of the forearm. On the most lateral side, we can see brachioradialis. More medially, the muscles of the flexor group of the forearm. Note the pronator teres that forms the medial boundary of the cubital fossa. Two other muscles are reflected, flexor carpi radialis and palmaris longus. The most medial muscle of the superficial group is the flexor carpi ulnaris. Now, by reflecting the muscles, the intermediate layer of the flexor compartment is better exposed. This intermediate layer is formed by flexor digitorum superficialis. So, muscle A is a flexor digitorum superficialis. You can follow the origin of the muscle and note that it arises in continuity from the common flexor origin at the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Then the origin extends obliquely across the forearm as it arises from both the ulna and the radius. The muscle is supplied by the median nerve, which supplies all the muscles of the flexor compartment of the forearm except one and a half muscles. And as you can see here, that the flesh of the muscle gives rise to four tendons to the medial four digits. The tendons pass deep to the flexor retinaculum, which is not shown here but the tendons ultimately are inserted into the middle phalanges of the medial four digits. Which of the muscles A to C is supplied by a branch from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus? List two of its actions. This is a close-up view showing lateral thoracic wall and the front and lateral side of the arm. All the muscles marked are supplied by branches of the brachial plexus, but not all of them from the lateral cord. So first let's identify the muscles. 
A is the deltoid muscle. It is shown here where it is inserted to the middle of the lateral aspect of the arm where the deltoid tuberosity is located. Deltoid is supplied by the axillary nerve from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, not from the lateral cord. C is the muscle with eight digitations that wraps around the thoracic wall. It is the serratus anterior muscle and it is supplied by the long thoracic nerve, which is a branch of the roots of the brachial plexus, C5, 6, and 7. So it is not derived from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. B is the most superficial in the flexor compartment of the arm, lying in front of brachialis, and it is the muscle with two heads, so it is the biceps brachii muscle. Like all other muscles in the flexor compartment of the arm, it is supplied by the musculocutaneous nerve, which is derived from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. In fact, it is one of the two terminal branches of this cord. The other terminal branch is the lateral root of the median nerve. Regarding the action, the action of biceps, biceps has two heads of origin, as its name implies. The long head, which is lateral, L4L, arises from the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula within the capsule of the shoulder joint. The short head arises from the tip of the coracoid process of the scapula in common with coracobrachialis muscle. Distally, the tendon crosses in front of the elbow joint to be inserted mainly into the radial tuberosity. The muscle crossing the elbow and being attached to the radius is a powerful flexor and supinator of the forearm. Proximally, its long head that crosses the shoulder joint helps in flexion at the shoulder. It may help you to remember that the action of biceps muscle is to put in the corkscrew. This is supination. It is the powerful supinator, more powerful than supinator muscle itself. And then the muscle pulls out the cork, and that is flexion of the elbow. Identify the structures A and B. Which ligament is located at C? A is a fibrous band or ligament extending downward and laterally between the proximal ulna and radius. It is called the oblique cord. Its fibers run in opposite direction to those of the interosseous membrane of the forearm, and its function is not clear. It may simply be an additional tie between the radius and ulna, aiding other soft tissue structures, such as the annular ligament and interosseous membrane, to bind the two bones together. B is the biceps tendon, and this is inserted into the radial tuberosity. The tendon is attached to the posterior part of the radial tuberosity, and there is a bursa intervening between the tendon and the remaining anterior part of the tuberosity. The supinator action of biceps is due to its insertion onto the posterior aspect of the radial tuberosity. So when the biceps contracts, not only is the forearm flexed, but the radius unwinds as its tuberosity is rotated anteriorly. That's to say the forearm supinates. It should be remembered that this is not the sole insertion of biceps, but there is an extension from the tendon called bicipital aponeurosis, which is a thin sheet of connective tissue that passes medially to blend with the deep fascia of the forearm. C is a thickening of the capsule of the elbow joint. The capsule of the elbow joint, like in other hinge joints, is strong except where it thins out anteriorly and posteriorly. So it is thickened by collateral ligaments on the sides. C is the ulnar or medial collateral ligaments. Although not detailed in this model, but it is made of three strong bands the anterior, posterior, and transverse bands. It is generally triangular in shape. The apex is at the medial epicondyle of the humerus, and the base is at the olecranon and coronoid processes of the ulna. Which muscle is attached to the distal bone fragment A and causes its displacement? A is the olecranon of the ulna, and the muscle attached to it is the triceps muscle. Direct violence results in fracture of the olecranon, in which case the fragments are widely separated. 
because the olecranon is pulled by the triceps. Thus, it requires surgical repair to reconstruct the integrity of the elbow joint. Sometimes, olecranon fracture results from avulsion by forcible contraction of triceps muscle. Identify the nerve A and the muscle B. This is a deep dissection of the flexor compartment of the arm, showing the biceps brachii being cut proximal to its tendon of insertion and reflected laterally, thus exposing the deep-lying brachialis muscle B. It is clear here that brachialis is deep and is attached to the front of the lower half of the humerus. Now sandwiched between the two muscles, biceps and brachialis, and supplying both is the nerve A, the musculocutaneous nerve. Follow the nerve proximally and note that it arises from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. Here's the capital M configuration, musculocutaneous arising from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. The other terminal branch is the lateral root of the median nerve. This is the medial cord of the brachial plexus supplying the medial root of the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. So you can see here the capital M configuration, the musculocutaneous nerve arising from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus passes through coracobrachialis to find itself in between biceps and brachialis supplying the three muscles of the flexor compartment of the arm. Thus it is sometimes remembered as the BBC nerve because it supplies biceps, brachialis and coracobrachialis. It is also called musculocutaneous because in addition to supplying the muscles of the flexor compartment of the arm, if you follow it distally here, you will find that it continues as a cutaneous nerve, lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. So it is musculocutaneous nerve. The other structures seen here are the brachial artery being pulled laterally by its muscular branches to biceps, which is already reflected. Also note the relation of the distal part of the brachial artery medial to the tendon of biceps, where its pulsations can be felt medial to the tendon of biceps in the cubital fossa. More medial to that is the median nerve. Note the proximal part of the nerve and the axilla arising from the medial and lateral roots of the median nerve from the corresponding cords of the brachial plexus. Also note here the ulnar nerve arising from the medial cord and the axilla. And if you follow it distally at the elbow, it passes behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus. Identify the artery A, what is its origin? and identify the artery B, name its two terminal branches. This is an angiogram showing A is the axillary artery, the continuation of the subclavian artery at the outer border of the first rib. Note that in this angiogram of the left subclavian artery, you can see that the left subclavian artery arises from the arch of the aorta directly. Now, the continuation of the axillary artery at the inferior border of teres major muscle is the brachial artery. It runs on the medial border of brachialis muscle until it reaches the cubital fossa in the front of the elbow joint, medial to the tendon of biceps. It ends opposite the neck of the radius by dividing into radial and ulnar arteries. Sometimes the division can take place proximally in the arm. Note the proximity of the brachial artery to the humerus against which the artery can be compressed either to control hemorrhage or to compress the brachial artery by the sphygmomanometer cuff while measuring the blood pressure. Also note here that arising from the brachial artery and passing posteriorly and obliquely downwards and laterally is the profunda brachii artery, this artery that accompanies the radial nerve and the spiral groove.